Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. You may have heard, but last week, there was a bit of an earthquake that shook the Attack on Titan fandom. A bit of a rupture. And so the outrage mainly revolved around the heavy use of CGI animation, not just on the Titans themselves, but also on some of the scouts. I've actually been following this story very, very closely. And so I guess I'll just start off with the basics. Attack on Titan changed studios the anime chain studios. Seasons 1, 2, and 3 were done by Studio Wit, and this final season, this fourth season of Attack on Titan, is currently being produced by Studio MAPPA. Now before I go on any further, I have to make this absolutely clear. I do not approve, condone, or otherwise support any of the harassment that has been going on against the staff, against the studio, or anyone. Not only is harassment wrong, but it's also incredibly counterproductive because it doesn't solve anything. In fact, it, it just ends up making matters worse for everybody involved. That doesn't mean that you can't criticize things, that you can't have an opinion on things. It just means that there is a huge difference between saying, you know what, this, this thing, it, it just wasn't for me. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't something that I personally uh, gravitated towards it didn't it didn't uh, align with you know my taste uh, saying that is one thing but actually going on Twitter and harassing the people who made that thing that is a completely different ball game and that is just not right now a basic question that comes after that is why did wit stop working on the series why did it not continue on to produce this final fourth season of Attack on Titan? Well, from what I read, it comes down to the schedule that Wit was being offered to produce the anime. See, apparently there's this thing called the committee that's in charge of allocating funding and deciding deadlines. So the committee is the one that sets the budget. Now the way it works is that whenever you greenlight something as an executive, you want to make sure that it's a good investment. It's the same thing in Hollywood. It's all about maximizing profit. So in this case, the committee decided that what they wanted for Attack on Titan season four is that they wanted the anime to coincide with the ending of the manga. Typically having an anime tends to boost up manga sales, but then also a manga nearing its end tends to also increase the interest and hype surrounding the property in the eyes of the general public. Unfortunately, the production schedule decided on for season four was just way too tight. And so not only did Wit Studio decide to step aside and not take on the project, but other studios that were approached with the same project, with the same schedule, also refused to take on the production of Attack on Titan Season 4. The only studio that said yes to the project with the schedule that was being offered was MAPPA. Now, something that's very important for you to know is that MAPPA is also a part of the production committee. At least it is now. So essentially what that means is that as a part of the committee, MAPPA gets a bigger chunk of the profits of the show than it normally would if it wasn't part of the committee. And there's nothing wrong with that. To me, it just kind of sounds like MAPPA made a deal. They came to an agreement. They probably went over to the committee and said, you know, uh, we've noticed that nobody else is willing to take on this job with the schedule that you want. So we're willing to take on the job, but in exchange, we want a bigger chunk of the profit. We want a seat on the committee. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. However, because of the reality of the situation, taking on a project this big, taking on a property this popular, especially with the amount of time that they were being offered, it's kind of like working with one arm tied behind your back. That's why no other studio wanted to take it, because they knew that they couldn't deliver. Now there's this thing called the triangle of truth. Maybe you've heard about it, but it's basically like this decision-making tool that you see here. This is the triangle. It's mainly used uh, to make decisions about production. So essentially the rule states that you have three sides, but you can only choose two. You can only ever choose two. You can't have all three. So you have to decide which two sides to pick from. You can decide to make something fast and good, but it won't be cheap. It's gonna cost you. That's one option. Number two is you do it fast and cheap and sacrifice quality. And number three is you try and do it high quality and cheap 
but then it won't be done fast. So production will go a lot slower because you need more time to ensure the quality of the product. And so we already know one side of the triangle when it comes to this season of Attack on Titan. We know for a fact that the committee wanted this anime to be done fast. Now the question is, what other side is being applied here? That's the question that's at the core of this debate, of this fan outrage. People can't agree on the quality of the show. Now initially, some of the main criticisms of the season came from people that were manga readers, right? And, and I completely, like, I could see why that was the case, because as a manga reader myself, I feel like we, since we, we kind of see the whole picture, like we know where the story is going, like, I'll just, I'll just speak for myself. I had a pretty clear idea of what scenes needed to be home runs. Is that my fault for having really high expectations? In, in part, yes, yes. I, I, take, I take responsibility for that. But it's, it also kind of comes down to the manga being so good. Like, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Attack on Titan is one of the best war graphic novels of all time. Like, I really mean that. Because aside from the action, it really does capture the essence of what war does to people. Of how war kind of messes with people's heads. And so in that regard, I do think that the anime has been doing a good job at capturing that, that essence. And when it comes to the animation, when it comes to the action and the CGI, the, the CGI gets brought up a lot as, as it being the main complaint. But I actually think there's a deeper reason that goes beyond the CGI, that, that people aren't really voicing explicitly, but this is what I picked up. I've been watching a lot of animation documentaries recently, you know, kind of like behind the scenes sort of stuff. And one of the things that gets brought up over and over again during production, during, during the making of, of these animated movies, is how do we make this world and characters believable? How do we make it so that they feel real within the world that they live in, right? And a big part of that comes down to the action, the, the characters that you see on screen blending in with the backgrounds. Because if you don't have that, that kind of breaks the spell. And so it's not believable and engagement and investment in the story that you're trying to tell goes down. So when people talk about noticing the CGI, I think what they're really saying is, yeah, it's kind of taking me out of the show. It's taking me out of this experience. Granted, this is a very subjective thing, and not everybody is like that. Last Sunday, I watched some of the reaction matchups on YouTube. People there seemed to be enjoying the show just fine. I mean, they were yelling, screaming, getting excited over Mikasa showing up, people losing it when Levi came in. And so the CGI for them wasn't enough to break their investment in what was happening on screen. And that's awesome. So even with the CGI, not everybody's having the same experience. Now, something that I did take issue with, and I don't know who made this decision. I thought it was, it was a poor marketing strategy decision. I think it may have worked in the short term to build up hype for the show, but in the long run, I think it ended up hurting the show because it almost felt like people were being misled. And that's the fact that they decided to release this gorgeous trailer, right? This gorgeous, mainly 2D animated trailer before the show premiered. And so of course most of the titans in that trailer are hand-drawn 2D animation. Not only that, but they also released this poster. This poster, I mean holy smokes, my jaw dropped the moment I saw this poster. This poster looks like it's promotional art for the critically acclaimed animated motion picture of the year. You know, back in my day, back when I was younger, there were these things called movie theaters, and movie theaters had hallways in them. And in those hallways, you would have posters of the coming attractions, right? And so that poster really brought me back to those times. Like, holy crap, I want to see that one. Take me to see that one, Mom. Now, the biggest counter-argument to defend the trailer I've seen floating around is that the trailer was pre-animated. Basically, what that means is that the trailer was animated just to be a trailer. Essentially, those scenes that you saw in the trailer do not exist outside of the trailer. And see, at first, I didn't know that about the trailer, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people also didn't know that. Because usually the way it works is that to make a trailer, you have an editor, and the editor picks, you know, bits and pieces, clips of 
the full movie or of like the season, something that's already kind of made. The editor picks and chooses different scenes and edits them together to create a promotional video. But that wasn't the case here. The scenes that you see in the trailer were just basically those scenes were specifically made to be a trailer. And so even though the purpose of a trailer should be to build up hype for the upcoming thing, I do think that it was a little bit misleading to show us that trailer knowing full well that they were never gonna show us those scenes in the first place. Again, it ended up working in the short term because it built up hype and anticipation for the season to start, but it didn't work well in the long term because even right now, people I've seen people pointing to that trailer and saying like, what happened to those scenes? Like, we, we wanted that. Now in the beginning, after the first episode aired, there was actually a lot of confusion within the fandom. I think even though a lot of it enjoyed the first episode, they were also kind of confused in terms of why the change needed to take place in the first place. Like, why the CGI? Some people were saying that it was because of consistency, that the studio had made the decision of adopting 3D CGI models for all of the Titan shifters, and that they would be using those models from episode one up until the end. Except that was proven not to be true in episode three, because in episode three, we clearly see the female Titan be animated in 2D. Also in the very same episode, there's a flashback with Reiner where he thinks back to when him and Bertolt busted through the walls, and they use Wit's animation to show that flashback. So that's him running in 2D, but then in the very same sequence, there is a shot of him in 3D CGI. So consistency is not the reason. There were other people saying that CGI was just cheaper, and that's why they were using it. Now here's the thing about that. Whether 3D CGI animation is cheaper to produce, than 2D hand-drawn animation? I don't know. I don't have enough information on that. I mean, I would assume that it depends on how much you're paying the animators, right? And it also depends on what kind of software you're using, right? Whether it's a cheap type of software or a pretty expensive piece of technology that they're using on the computer. You know how in the previous seasons they only used CGI on two Titans, which were the Colossal Titan and then Rod's Titan. I guess I always thought that the reason for them using CGI on those two Titans specifically was because they were the biggest Titans in the show. And so I thought, oh, they're kind of playing with the perspective of it because they're so large. Sort of what like the Marvel movies do with Ant-Man where he's so big that it almost seems like he's moving in slow motion. So I thought that's what they were going for, but then I kept looking into it and this is what I found. The biggest advantage that CGI animation has over 2D hand-drawn animation is that it's faster. I was watching a documentary on the making of Frozen 2, and it turns out that four to three months before the film's release date, they were still changing things, they were still writing things, but the reason for why they could afford to make decisions that late in the production stage is because CGI is a lot faster to use. You can manipulate it faster, you can adapt it faster, you can fix it faster. Just take a look at this interview of a Disney animation veteran who has worked on both CGI features and hand-drawn animated features. He basically says that hand-drawn animation is a lot harder to make and it takes a lot more time because in case you need to make changes to your work, in case the director shows up and tells you, you know, I need you to make these changes to the animation, the animator has to go back and essentially redo their work. I don't know if you've seen it already, but I really recommend watching this video right here. It's a glimpse into the life of a Japanese animator. Now, I'm not saying that every animator is in the exact same situation as the girl in that video, but that video, to me at least, was, was heartbreaking, but it was also very eye-opening in terms of what their situation looks like. In the video, the girl talks about how there's not enough 2D animators anymore because it doesn't pay enough. Like, the job is very, very, very poorly paid. In fact, if, if you watch the video, you'll find that the girl can't even pay rent. But the reason for why she's able to continue to follow her passion and follow her dream of being an animator is because she lives in a special, uh, special housing. It's this crowd-funded apartment complex with rooms that get rented out to people who are animators so that they can afford to pay rent because otherwise they wouldn't be able to with what they make. And since they're not being compensated enough, it just comes down to the love of the craft, you know? 
the fact that they love what they do, they're passionate about their work, that's what keeps them going. Now granted, uh, that was just one video, I, I think it would be hasty and inaccurate to say that, that the, the person in that video is every single animator. I don't think that would be accurate. I don't know what the situation is within each specific studio, but I did find that video to be very insightful, very eye-opening, and so I do think that everybody should watch it if they haven't already. And it really brings home the point of not harassing the staff because the truth is you, you don't know what they're going through, you don't know what their situation is, and so like, you know, tracking them down, sending them hate, you know, harassing them about their work, that, that doesn't help anything. I think one of the best tweets to come out of this entire thing was this one. It says, don't harass the staff for their hard work. Don't praise their employer for achievements and ideology they don't possess. That being said, this week's episode, I mean, you can just tell that these shots were planned so much better. The way the lighting and the color was used was such an improvement. Early on in the video, I was talking about believability. This episode really made me feel and empathize for the Marlians. I was like, man, these people are getting slaughtered. This is their home, and they're being invaded right now. Innocent civilians are dying. You know, the scene with the little kid being alive after Armin nukes the place? That was not in the manga. In the manga, the little boy wasn't shown to be alive afterwards. But the anime having him still be alive, I think, worked really well to drive the point home. Like, to me, it kind of made Armin's actions feel worse than they did in the manga. That's one of the things that really stands out from this episode is that we see these characters, these people that we've gotten to know, and we see their boundaries get pushed. Another example is John. John was literally just about to kill Falco. And then you have Eren, whose objective is to get the Warhammer, and he comes up with this very logical, creative solution to get it. But it's also the type of creativity and logic that you would expect somebody like a serial killer to have. So you kind of find yourself torn between wanting to cheer him on and finding the scene disturbing. So the manga definitely begins to show these characters in a new light, and I think the anime was very successful this time at conveying that that as well. Another scene that I thought was great was the scene with Sasha where they ambush the cart because she snipes the guy from the panzer unit and his machine gun just keeps going on for a while and then suddenly everything goes silent. Those are the kind of details that make this believable. That's what animation is supposed to do. Like the episode still has its flaws but I think that you can really tell that in addition to the passion this week's episode was also handled with a lot of care. I just want to show you guys this quote from one of the 3D directors of the show. He basically says that the main difference between Wit and Mappa is that essentially Wit would plan things well out in advance, whereas Mappa is more flexible and they make adjustments depending on the situation. I also read another interview with a Chinese animator working on the show that said that as long as people were respectful with their comments, that they would actually welcome constructive criticism and feedback. In fact, he said that the feedback would help because it would make it easier for the production to understand the show from an audience's perspective. Now, this is just me being overly optimistic, but I did read that they were also planning on polishing the CGI further for their Blu-ray releases. And so since technology is evolving at such a fast rate, I mean, there are things being done in animation that have never been done before, like the technology used in Paper Man, which is a 2D and 3D animation hybrid where you combine hand-drawn animation onto the CGI, or the type of animation that was used in Claws, where even though the film is hand-drawn, drawn, they do effects with the lighting where it changes the entire thing and makes it look like it's CGI, but it's actually not. And so I do wonder if there's a technology that can make something that's 2D look like it's CGI, could there perhaps be something out there that can do the opposite? Granted, the technologies used on Claws and Paper Man were homegrown. They were essentially invented within the studios themselves. So I don't know how available that technology would be. But I do think that because the CGI models are easier to manipulate, I think there could be opportunities to polish some of the shots and make them more immersive, which is the thing that I've seen fans ask for. Now, the thing is, is that most of the comments I've read, yes, some of them were hateful, some of them were straight up trolls, but the vast majority of the fandom, I do think that their opinions are being expressed 
out of a love for the series. Like, no matter what side of the debate you're on, if you filter out the noise, I think you'll find that the thing that most of us have in common is that we really do love this story. That's gonna do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought about the points I made. Plus, what did you think about this week's episode of Attack on Titan? Leave me your thoughts down below. Thanks again. I'll catch you guys later. Bye.